In the wake of a disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal, disappointing economic news, and a border that remains wide open, it's changed the subject o'clock for the Biden White House. That's a thing, apparently. Don't worry about all that other stuff. It's climate change they want you thinking about now. We'll take a look at the left's desperate attempt to deflect in tonight's Hold the Line. Welcome to the Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. It's political panic time at the White House. Things are not going well. That should be obvious at this point. Anyone who is observing this Biden administration must be fully aware that things are not going as planned for them in year one. Things are looking pretty rough because of all the crises, all the blunders, all the major mistakes that have been made along the way. So here's just an example of it. It is a poll from YouGov and The Economist on Biden's overall approval rating, 39% approve and 50% disapprove. So guess what? This is about as bad as you're going to see in the first year of a presidency that, remember, we were told was going to be uh, a moment of unity for the American people, was going to bring us all together, was going to bring back normalcy. And when you look at the uh, breakdown of this, when you look at what's actually happening by party affiliation, GOP 9% approve of Biden, no shock there. Independents though, only 35%. And then Democrats are up at 77. But you got to remember during the Trump presidency, Republican approval, GOP approv uh, approval for Donald Trump was very, very high. So there's no question that this is looking pretty rough for Team Biden. And we're going to be heading into a midterm election year here pretty soon when there'll be a whole lot of folks focusing in on, well, those independents and the overall narrative of whether the Biden administration is doing a good job, how the Democrat controlled the House and de facto majority they wield in the Senate is actually doing for the American people. It's not looking good right now. So what do they do? What point does the Democrat Party make? What is their pitch for, oh, don't worry, we've got this, we know, what's, we, we know what we're doing, we know what's going on. There really isn't one. So climate change is where they take us. All of a sudden, you're seeing so much talk, all these stories about climate change. Here's just a, a smattering, if you will, of the talking points. Saving the planet, addressing the climate crisis is a health issue. This is the effect of climate change that we're seeing. Climate change is making all that a moot point. Fall's going by the wayside in a few years. Whole calendar is going to be summer and then hot summer. Now, you know the climate crisis. You know the climate crisis is bad when the once in a century global pandemic is the second biggest story of the day. Notice instead of the bottom there, Dems pivot to climate, climate change, right? That's what this is. This is just the tactics of distraction meant to get people to stop thinking about how inept and how buffoonish the Biden team is, and instead to focus on what they call the existential threat of climate change. There's also, though, something a bit more nefarious. Yeah, there's the usual propaganda at work here. But beyond that, we have uh, the mobilization of people under authoritarian COVID rules and the Democrat Party wants to continue with that. They want a compliant population, not just for all things COVID related, but also so they can get the Green New Deal passed. And they'll say whatever they, not just the Green New Deal passed as an actual bill, it doesn't matter whether it is called that or not. They're just looking to get those kinds of policies, those green energy policies through the Biden administration saying they want 50% solar energy for the US by 2050, as if that's ever going to happen. It's flatly ridiculous, but they're making a ridiculous pitch in the first place. I mean, here's Nancy Pelosi, who's out there saying, you know, we've just had some bad storms. We've had some severe weather events. Mother Nature is unhappy with us. On another note, and be, as we see the wildfires in the West, we see them at home. You, the smoke, it's, it's so devastating. As you see the floods of Ida, the, the storms of Ida in the south and in the northeast. Mother Nature is not happy with us in terms of how we recognize that challenges face us. I mean, I'm not happy with Nancy Pelosi, but 
at least there's an argument to be made that that's rooted in reality. Mother Nature is not happy with us because of climate change. This, this is a religious belief masquerading as a scientific necessity. There's a lot of that going on these days, whether it's climate change or has to do with the pandemic. Speaking of which, some Democrats are actually willing to connect these things very clearly. They're willing to pull these issues together. Here's AOC who wants you to know that we better tackle climate change ASAP. Of course, it's an existential threat. It's all these scary things that they say, and it could create, that's right, climate change could make more pandemics. So basically, if we do nothing to address climate change, we are going to see the continued destruction of our supply chains. We are going to see our crops not be able to grow in the same way. We will see our infrastructure begin to crumble away. We will see us not we will see, you know, the continuation prolifer proliferation of other future pandemics as well. Uh, how is it possible that someone can go on TV and just say things that are so stupid. And Anderson Cooper with his, you know, smart journalist glasses on. Yes. Oh, that's so wise, AOC. Tell us more about, does, does Ocasio-Cortez know anything about crops? Does she know anything about the subject matter that she is waxing philosophical on TV about? No, of course not. But that's not what's at issue for Democrats. It doesn't matter that she's an ignoramus. It doesn't matter what she's saying is crazy. It's that we're talking about climate change which the Democrat left and the environmentalist donors want to hear about. And it's not Joe Biden is the most inept president we've seen since Jimmy Carter and perhaps already has exceeded Jimmy Carter's ignominious reputation for inability when it comes to being the commander in chief. Um, but there's a clear movement underway right now with getting everybody to think about climate change. The media has decided this is a big story. Here's a bunch of headlines, CBS News how climate change helped strengthen the Taliban. Oh, so it's not that Biden messed things up in Afghanistan. It's that climate change made the Taliban so strong. Here's a political headline. It's not that Biden messed up the border. It's not a border crisis. It's a climate crisis. Oh, I see. It's not Joe Biden's fault. It's the climate's fault. And then, of course, this Economist headline. Could climate change trigger a financial crisis? It's not that Biden wants to spend three and a half trillion dollars and take our debt over 30 trillion and create runaway inflation and all that. No, it's the climate crisis that is causing all these problems. This is a religious belief um, and not a, not a particularly clever one and not a moral or ethical one, but people attach the same kind of sentimentality to it. All right, kids across the country are headed back to school this week, and despite a vaccination rate north of 60% in the U.S., parents have noticed the classroom doesn't seem to have changed much since last year. After the break, New York Post columnist Carol Markowitz stops by to discuss the restrictive guidelines in many American schools. But before that, I want to talk to you about my friends at Black Rifle Coffee. If you're like me, you need to start off your day with some caffeine. That means Black Rifle Coffee. Black Rifle is a veteran-owned coffee company, and these are people who love America and love bringing you the best coffee you can get anywhere. With every purchase you make, Black Rifle Coffee gives back. In 2020, they donated over 6 million cups of coffee to veteran law enforcement and first responder causes. Their high-quality coffee beans are imported all the way from Colombia and Brazil. They carefully roast them at their facilities in Tennessee and Utah, and they've got a signature roast called Lava Panther that's directly sourced from a small farm in Guatemala. Although the temperatures are cooling off, don't forget to keep enjoying the great outdoors fueled by Black Rifle. And join the coffee club for Black Rifle, too. You'll see great discounts and deals available to you. Purchase today at blackriflecoffee.com buck and use code buck at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. New York Post, Carol Markowitz, coming up next. The start of the new school year has arrived for students and teachers across the country, but as classrooms finally open their doors and reliance on virtual learning starts to fade, parents remain up in arms in many places with the CDC's latest guidance for mask mandates, regardless of vaccination status. Carol Markowitz is a columnist for the New York Post, contributing writer for the DC Examiner. She joins to be on uh, the show now to talk about the hypocrisy in and out of the classroom. Carol, good to see you. What's going on here? Yeah. You know, nothing good. Uh, we're in the same place that we were a year ago, if um, you know, if that. 
Uh, schools are set to open in New York City, for example, on Monday. Kids will be masked. I just heard from my son's school that they will be masked at recess outside and they will be uh, distanced at recess. So for all you know, tag or sports or whatever, they will be wearing masks and expected to keep um, some three feet of distance. I mean, it's crazy town. It's oh, really wait, insane. Can I, can I ask Carol, like, this is because you've been you've been fighting this for a long time, and and yeah. I've been talking about this. Right. Who is there a person who actually thinks who will make the case as an individual? I feel like everyone always says, "Oh no, this is the policy." Someone must right. be making the policy. I, is there a person who will defend masking children outside? Because I want to meet this person and ask them why they're so stupid. Right. Well, a story broke today. I don't know if you saw it yet. It was just sort of breaking as um, a little while ago that the NEA, the teachers union, had, of course, as we all kind of knew, but now we really know, pressured the CDC to change their guidelines on masking in schools and to make it mandatory. Uh, so here we are where the teachers unions are once again running policy and nobody seems to care. A special interest group is completely politicized the, the Center for Disease Control, and we're all sort of just supposed to be okay with that. And so, yeah, is there somebody, there's nobody that will speak up and say so. I mean, you know, I have a lot of people on Twitter, for example, be like, you know, yell at your kid's school or like, what are they going to do? They're just getting orders from the Department of Education of New York City, who are getting it from the Department of Education of the state, who are getting it from the CDC. It, it's just hitting your head against the wall. You had a, a Twitter uh, thread here facing each other, no fun lunches, no touching, no unmasking, waiting in line separated for everything they do, sitting on hard concrete floors for lunch, facing forward, quarantining while healthy, missing activities while healthy, no older kids teaching younger kids, no parents yeah. in the room, no volunteers in, uh, in the holding, no parties, no harvest day, no bake sale, no field trips, no smiles, no normality in school. Yet the second school ends, all of this happens with the others outside right. of school. I mean, to, to the point you're making here, Carol, yeah. what is wrong? Why are, are teachers unions just run by power mad psychopaths? Like what, what, what do they really yeah. think they're accomplishing with this? Do they even That's have? Right. Do they even try to make the case for anybody? I, I really do think they're run by power mad psychopaths. I there's no other reason here. It's not like Britain doesn't care about their kids. It's not like you know Sweden, Norway, Holland, um, any other any of the other places don't care about their kids. I just came back from Iceland. They did not mask kids ever. My kids didn't even have to test to get into the country. They did, however, have to take a COVID test to get back into the United States. So. The way we're treating kids in the U.S. is really unusual to the rest of the Western world, and nobody seems to care. For once, the, the left is not pointing at Scandinavia and saying, let's do it like them. It makes no sense. I mean, you're, you're back here uh, in New York as I am. I'm just wondering, are, are you finding that more parents are starting to recognize just how arbitrary and pointless and, and oppressive all of this is? Or, I mean, one, one thing, and you know, you know I do a radio show with Clay Travis, and he uh, got some national attention for speaking out at a, Na well, it was actually south of Nashville in, in, uh, in Franklin, yeah. Tennessee. Um, but he spoke at a, at a school there and there were parents, and this was, this was pretty shocking. He said there were parents who showed up who were terrified their children were going to die from COVID. And they thought that that was a right. real risk, a real concern. Yeah. What are you coming across as a New York parent are, are they that deluded, the ones around you? They really think that masks are going to save, you know, little Timmy or little Susie from dying of COVID? Or do they recognize this for being the absurdity that it is? What's going on? It's a mix. It's a mix. I would say the majority of the parents I encounter who do not care about their kids being masked in school will say like, yeah, I don't know if it really helps anything. But, you know, Delta, who knows, better safe than sorry. But when I explain that masks are really supposed to be worn, you know, and I forget about the kind of masks we wear, where the kid wears the old Navy $5 mask, like straight under their nose. Um, but, you know, when I when I say like masking is generally did, in, done in cultures like in Asia, for example, when you feel like you might have a cold coming on and you don't want to infect others, it's not for your kid to be protected. It's for them not to infect other people. I just think so much has gotten lost in our in our sanity here. These parents are 
worried about the wrong thing and they're afraid to speak up because you don't want to be the the and you know known as the person who wants teachers to die or or you know the anti-science republican or whatever but the fact is that the teachers unions have been anti-science all along do you think there's a chance that we might be pushed back into a at least a hybrid remote learning situation in places like new york as we go into the winter season here i mean 300 percent increase year over year in cases nationwide over Labor Day, which is amazing because I thought right. Joe Biden said he was going to crush the virus. Well, apparently that didn't happen. And we have vaccines sure. now. 200 million Americans mm -hmm. have gotten vaccinated, but we have a yeah. higher caseload than we did a year ago. No one seems to be even willing to address this or make sense of it, Carol. But back right. to the, uh, the question I was trying to pose to you, you, you think they might actually go back to remote learning in New York as well as some other, uh, some other major cities? I would love to place that bet somewhere. If Atlantic City will take that bet, I would be placing that bet. Um, absolutely, we're going to return to some sort of hybrid or remote. The thing is that throughout this summer, as places like Florida, for example, had spikes, we had all this celebration on the internet, like, oh, those stupid Floridians, they're, they're doing things all wrong. They're not doing anything different from us. They were having spikes before schools opened. So it wasn't the, the DeSantis, you know, against mask mandate ruled. It had nothing to do with that. Plus, the schools had, many schools had mandated masks anyway, overruling him. And they experienced spikes. So it's, it just, we're, we're in a place in New York City, for example, where we think that we're doing things right. But this feels very familiar. Last summer, we also celebrated. Last summer, we also laughed at Florida. Last summer, we also thought that we beat this thing. And then in November, December, we had the spikes again. I would say we're definitely heading for a, a late fall, early winter spike in, in places like New York that had it last year. And I absolutely think schools will be the first thing to shut down because we don't follow the science at all. Carol? Our work is not done. We gotta get out of here. Um, we gotta go. I mean, we 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 are in this fight together, and I thank you for what you've done in it so far. And I'm just, I don't know what it's going to take for people to stop being so crazy and just, it's just. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm honestly almost at a loss, but we got to stay in the fight. Thanks so much for being here. We'll talk to you again about this soon. The left is freaking out after Texas passed a law restricting abortions after a heartbeat is detected in a preborn baby. Problem is, they can't even seem to figure out who the law affects. Is it women? Is it birthing people? People who menstruate? These are terms they use. After the break, we'll talk to the first TV's Tiana Lowe about the left's bizarre relationship with uh, the English language. And we'll also be talking to you for a moment here about investing. It seems like people want to get into crypto these days more than ever. Bitcoin, Ethereum, so many digital tokens, but it's not easy to get started. That's where my digital money comes in. This is an easy to use self-trading crypto IRA platform with top tier customer service. They'll help you get started if you've never done crypto investing before and your comfort and security is their top priority. They'll give you an unparalleled military grade security for your coins, trigger orders. You can secure opportunities for gains or limit those losses without having to constantly be on top of your account. Even though they'll give you a play money account so you can test the market without risking money. Look, when it comes to your money, you deserve a team of dedicated professionals who will speak to you honestly and treat you like a human, not a number. Check them out today at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. We'll be right back with more Hold the Line. One, I don't know if he is familiar with a menstruating person's body. In fact, I do know that he's not familiar with a woman, with a, a, a female or menstruating person's body. And I'm sorry we have to break it down on, you know, break down biology 101 on national television. And two weeks late on your period for any person, any person with a menstrual cycle can happen if you're stressed, if your diet changes, or for really no reason at all. For a person with a menstrual cycle, also known as a woman, I think, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went after Texas Governor Greg Abbott there over his state's new six-week abortion ban based on being able to detect a heartbeat in a fetus, a uh, preborn baby. She rep uh, repeatedly referred to women, as you saw there, as menstruating people. The progressive New York Democrats spoke out criticizing Abbott of ignorant of reproductive science, but appeared to trip over her own phrasing, and it was pretty remarkable. Tina Lowe is a commentator of the DC Examiner, contributor here at The First TV. She joins me now to dive into this. So we have words in the English language that one couldn't, can string together uh, and come up with a way to describe a person 
as having a menstrual cycle or a person who is capable of giving birth to another human being, I was under the impression that woman or women uh, would be the preferred word for this, but the left rejects this, Tina. Why? Fuck, it's not just the left. It's now officially the CDC guidance in the middle of this pandemic that they swear is serious enough that they need to shut down the economy again. The CDC put out guidance that said, you are not supposed to just use he or she, and you're not supposed to use man or woman. Um, you're supposed to be using a person who can give birth. Uh, you know, and, and then we've also just seen basic, you know, non-biologically bifurcated terms like breasts. You know, there is in, in medical parlance, men have a breastbone, women have a breastbone, and still, you know, the progressive left wants us to now use chest feeders. Um, it, it is, and it's funny because wait, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and, that's the chest feeders is now a thing. Chest feeders is now a thing. Everything that we could expect in terms of trans insanity just hops across the pond, right? You know, we, I mean, think about how radical this debate has gone. Five years ago, it was, are you fine calling Caitlyn Jenner she and fine with a trans woman using an adult woman's restroom? Now it's, can we use poop? Can we use puberty blockers on eight year olds? And can we erase women from biological science? It's like we don't exist. And it only ever does go one way, which is funny that the feminists don't really care about that. How is it possible to be a champion for what had previously uh, been called women's rights, let's say? And, you know, there are, the left would obviously suggest AOC and others would believe that abortion is, is, uh, is the preeminent women's right, at least in this country, under the regime of Roe v. Wade. Uh, that's what they've been saying. But how could you champion women's rights if you won't even use the term women? <laughs> that's a, that seems to be a, a challenge for people who live in a reality-based universe. Well, I think the modern Democratic Party, or at least its loudest mouthpieces, have made clear that they don't really care about the whole women thing. You know, the women in Afghanistan who are going to be raped and sold into sexual slavery by the Taliban, they don't really matter. But if you're a woman in Texas, fully capable of getting contraception or plan B through your doctor, fully capable of planning and empowering yourself before conception, you're oppressed now. Feminism, on the one hand, you have to be a girl boss in the C-suite in the boardroom, but also you are oppressed, fragile little snowflake who needs protection by daddy government because they don't trust that you can use a pill properly. I mean, it, it, it's a completely backward, broken mentality of, are women strong and smart and capable of making decisions proactively for themselves? Or are they fragile little victims who depend on the nanny state to tell them what to do? AOC got a lot of airtime and a lot of attention uh, in this CNN interview she did. Uh, one thing she said that I, I want you to break down for us is that the Texas law, which has some complexity as to what it act, the actual mechanism is, it allows for private citizens to sue the providers of abortions, not actually the uh, woman who has, uh, there's that word again, who has gotten the abortion. Uh, and since the state's not doing it, there are standing issues. This was all designed to essentially create uh, restrictions on abortion starting at, at you know, six weeks into a pregnancy. And AOC though said that it perpetuates rape culture. Let's, let's listen to this one. What this is about is controlling women's bodies and controlling people who are not cisgender men. This is about making sure that someone like me as a woman or any menstruating person in this country cannot make decisions over their own body. What that shares with rape culture is that sexual assault is about the abuse of power and sexual assault is about asserting control over another person. Stopping abortion is rape culture now? Please explain. It's, it's honestly insulting that she that she's comparing a law that has a lot of problems. I've been critical of this law with promoting rape culture. You know, if you want to criticize the law, you can point out that it will likely not stand in court the more the moment it actually goes into effect. The issue that the Supreme Court had was they didn't really actually have anyone withstanding. No one could prove that they were actually harmed by this law because it hadn't gone into, into effect yet, correct? So once it does go into effect and when someone does bring up an actual challenge, you know, it, it, I don't know how the courts will decide, but based on all the legal experts I've talked to, it seems like it might not stand. Instead, she goes to the, to the worst faith assumption 
challenging the idea, not that Republicans genuinely care about the lives of the unborn, genuinely have a respect and a belief that every life matters, but rather that this is just a bunch of men who want to assert control over women's bodies. How about this to AOC? AOC is in Congress, the president is also a Democrat. She could ask Joe Biden to command the FDA tomorrow to clear oral contraceptives to be over the counter in all 50 states. That's Joe Biden's job, he could do that. But instead, what is the rest of the Democratic Party going to be? They're going to complain, they're going to cut campaign ads about this without actually doing anything. Because it's much easier to whine than it is to govern. It's much easier just to accuse the person who disagrees with you that they're just promoting rape culture than sort through the genuine fundamental first principle disagreements. I mean, you mentioned legal experts you've talked to. I, I'm not a lawyer, uh, nor do I play one on this show. But I do know this isn't true. AOC uh, tweeted that Republicans promised to overturn Roe v. Wade, and they have. Democrats can either abolish the filibuster and expand the court or do nothing as millions of people's bodies, rights, and lives are sacrificed for far-right minority rule. This shouldn't be a difficult decision. Um, no, they haven't overturned Roe v. Wade. I, does, does it just not matter? She just says whatever she wants and everyone on the Instagram goes, yes, AOC. You know what? I dare her to abolish the filibuster because you know what happens in this upcoming Supreme Court term. SCOTUS will rule on a proposed or on a law passed by the Mississippi state legislature that would actually ban abortion at 15 weeks, which is a direct challenge to the viability framework established by, by Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Right now, the court says you cannot create an abortion restriction prior to the point of fetal viability, which the court says is around 24 weeks, is probably closer to 20 weeks. If they allow the abortion ban on 15 weeks, which would essentially overturn the undue burden of Roe, and if Republicans do take back the Senate and do take back the House, which seems fairly likely, Buck, do you know how fast we're gonna federally ban abortions like that? There's a reason why, why you know Democrats pushed, pushed McConnell not to blow up the filibuster and McConnell agreed, but if they wanna play this game, go ahead. All right, Tina. Thanks so much for being with us. Good to see you. Thank you. Some bad news for a city that's seen a dramatic rise in violent crime this year. A new report shows Seattle, Washington could lose as many as 200 police officers over the city's COVID-19 vaccine mandate. We'll have more on that with Seattle talk, uh, talk show host Jason Rance coming up. But first, let's talk about the most important asset you own, your home. I mean, how much equity do you have in your home? 50,000, 100,000, more? Cybercrime experts are alerting homeowners the more equity you have, the greater the chance foreign and domestic criminals will come after you. Home title theft is one of the fastest growing crimes out there. In fact, Home Title Lock, America's leader in home title protection, is alerting homeowners they could already be a victim and not know it. Here's how it goes down. First, cyber thieves search hundreds of public databases for high equity homes. Then they pull your home's online title, forge your signature stating you sold your home, and take out loans using your equity. You're not covered by insurance, your bank, or common identity theft programs. Protect your most valuable asset today. Register your address now to see if you're already a victim and receive a complete title history of your home, a $100 value, free. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. Again, that's HomeTitleLock.com. Conservative talk show host from Seattle, Jason Rance, is with us when we come back. Over 200 Seattle police officers are on the brink of losing their jobs over the city's COVID-19 vaccine mandate, either because they've not received the jab or are refusing to hand over their private medical data. How dystopian of them. Our next guest says the number represents about 20% of the department's deployable staff. So what will happen to the already disorderly city of Seattle if police officers lose their jobs? Let's ask Jason Rance, host of the Jason Rance Show and a Seattle local. Great to see you, my friend. Good to see you. So the Seattle Police Department's already stretched thin. Feels like they can't afford to lose any more officers. What's going on here? I mean, you'd think that people in the city would say, hold on, we can't lose 20% of the deployable force over the vaccine mandate, can we? Or, or can they? I don't think very many people in Seattle actually know what's on the line here. So Mayor Jenny Durkin following in the footsteps of Governor Jay Inslee instituted a mandatory vaccine proclamation. You have until October 18th to be fully vaccinated. But at the same time, you have about 200 officers who are either saying, no, I don't want to get the vaccine or no, I don't think you have the right to tell me this, so I'm not going to do it. Now, the threat is of termination, both on uh, the mayor's side, but also 
coming down from Governor Jay Inslee. His proclamation goes for all of the healthcare workers, all staff at a school, and all agency employees, which include the Washington State Troopers, which finds itself in almost an identical position as the Seattle Police Department goes. So we'll see how the city responds and really how the state is going to respond. But at this point, unless something gives, and there's no indication that anything's gonna give, the mayor's gonna be in a position to fire about 200 officers for Seattle Police Department, which would put us at catastrophic numbers right now. We can't properly police the city. We have an, a deployable staff number of about 1,050 or so. We lost a third of the officers, about 300 since last year and all of the nonsense surrounding the defund the police movement. So this is not looking good for the SPD. What do the officers who would be affected by this, what, what is their, their position, their counter proposal, Jason? Is it just they oppose the mandate or there was a personal medical history issue? Just what do they want here? Do they want more time? Tell us about their side of it. Yeah, there's a little bit of, of mixed commentary coming from SPD, because on the one hand, you've got the people, like I said, who just don't want to take the vaccine and or have been vaccinated, just think this is government overreach. You do have others who are saying it's kind of unfair to throw this on us with such little notice. Why are you not accommodating our request not to get vaccinated, whereas the last 17 months, you've accommodated all of us not being vaccinated, right? Up until recently when the vaccine became widely available, you were having police officers go out into the field using PPE or covering their face with a mask. Why all of a sudden is it so dangerous given the context of the more people we're, contact, we're coming into contact with now, they're vaccinated, they're almost all vaccinated. We have in Seattle somewhere between a 70 and 82% rate of either got the first shot or fully vaccinated. So it doesn't really make sense. There are still, however, some negotiations going on because this was subject to impact um, bargaining with the Seattle Police Officers Guild. But so far, like I said, there doesn't seem to be any give in, in a related story that's not about cost, but about teachers. Just yesterday, Tuesday at 4 p.m. is when the religious exemption and medical exemption forms went out to the staff members who under this proclamation had to be vaccinated by, fully vaccinated by October 18th. The reason why it's important that it came out yesterday, well, this past Monday was when the last day was to get the Moderna virus in order to, uh, the Moderna vaccination in order to be fully vaccinated by October 18th. So they're running out the clock and it seems like they're putting all these people in positions where they're either going to be forced into getting this vaccine against their will, or they're going to risk losing their jobs. Washington Governor Inslee announced the um, mandate late last month. Let's just see what he said. We will be requiring our state workers and our contractors who come onto our sites and workers in private health care and long-term care settings to be vaccinated as a condition of further employment. Individuals covered by this order I will issue today will have until October 18th to become fully vaccinated against the COVID disease. That was on August 9th of last month there. And, and Jason, uh, I'm just wondering, do we have any, any knowledge at this point, any indication as to whether booster shots will also be a contingent uh, issue for those who are employed by the state? Do we know? Well, they haven't spoken specifically to it, but I think it's fairly clear that that's the direction that this governor will go in. And I think in that clip, I think it's really important to point out, he says, as a condition of employment. The reason why they do that is because the people who get terminated as of right now, unless their unions are able to make some sort of special accommodations or special deals, if you get fired for not getting vaccinated, you are not eligible for unemployment. So in the state of Washington, you will not have any kind of safety net afterwards if you're being pushed out of a job through no fault of your own for failing to comply with a vaccine mandate that just came out of nowhere, which by the way, applies to people regardless of their age, regardless of whether or not they already had COVID. I think that's an incredibly important piece here because anytime anyone pushes back against these mandates, they say, you're anti-vax. I'm not anti-vax. I am pro-vaccine if you want one. And I think people should have those conversations with their doctors. I just don't believe that it's the government's right to force any kind of private medical decision on people. I just think that's wrong. I'm just wondering also, how is the uh, fight against COVID in the state of Washington going? Well, we've seen a lot of reporting from national news media 
uh, Jason, about Florida, which is now on the down down part of its curve uh, for cases. Texas also in the downward uh, in the downward trajectory, but. Oregon, I know, had an all-time high for cases recently. How's Washington doing, Washington State? We, we haven't hit an all-time high of cases, but we do have an uptick in cases. There's no doubt about that, and the majority of them are vaccinated, although I will point out 26,000 or 27,000 of them are breakthrough cases that we know of, and that number is probably low. What I've been really pushing home, because I think this is an important part of this conversation, is the breakthrough case rate in Washington state is about 0.5, 0.6%. Now, we believe that's low because if you're vaccinated and you are asymptomatic, but you had COVID, obviously you're not going in and getting checked to see if you actually have it. So that's not part of the data. But it's an important piece because the death rate in Washington state is 1.1%. That's obviously higher than it should be for the same exact reason of asymptomatic people didn't go in to go ahead and get a test. So that data isn't actually coming through, but we have a general understanding of the death rate because that's the data that we do have access to. So the breakthrough case rate is as low as the death rate. And yet we are pretending that the only thing we should be focused on, the only thing we should talk about is the vaccination rate to get more people vaccinated. It is fear mongering. It is wrong. And I think because they're being so dishonest and disingenuous with the data, they end up pushing people away from, for the most part, for most people, a vaccine is probably the smart decision, the right decision. But they're pushing people away with all of these onerous rules, these mandates, and just being dishonest about the, the data and what it actually tells us. Jason, thanks so much, man. Good to talk to you as always. Thanks, Buck. Appreciate it. Coming up, the State Department has expressed concerns over the new interim Afghan government uh, announced by the Taliban, pointing out the lack of female representation. Yeah, shocking. I know. We'll have that and more in quick hits. But first, everybody wants to invest in crypto these days, right? But how do you get started? That's why Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold, created My Digital Money. It's an easy-to-use, self-trading crypto IRA platform with concierge-level customer service. Because your comfort and security is their top priority, they offer an unparalleled military-grade security for your coins. They also will help you secure opportunities with trigger orders for gains or to limit your losses. And a play money account so you can test the market without risking your actual money. Crypto markets heating up again. This might be the best time in a long time to get into this exciting technology-based investment. You deserve a team of dedicated professionals who have you your back and speak to you like a human, not a number. That's what you'll get at MyDigitalMoney.com. That's MyDigitalMoney.com. Quick hits up next. Stay with us. An affluent white mom boasts about how proud she is that her teenage daughter flipped off an anti-mask uh, protest group. And President Biden says people don't use the word tornado anymore. News to me. Time for quick hits. Let's do it. Um, may, maybe twister is the word that he's looking for. It's amazing that Joe Biden is the president. Every day I wake up and I think that guy is running this country. That's astonishing, terrifying in some ways, but also truly astonishing. And Biden wants you to know that you should not call them tornadoes, or rather they're not called tornadoes anymore. Here's what he said. Uh, you know, the looks like a tornado, they don't call them that anymore, that hit the crops and, and wetlands in the middle of the country and in Iowa and Nevada. And I mean, it's just across the board. And, uh, you know, um, uh, as I said, we're in this together. What, what, do they, what do they call them? I, what, is there another term, guys? Is there something that I'm missing here? Twister is kind of a fun one, right? It brings you back to Wizard of Oz. Remember the house falls on the, the bad witch, and then there's the other wicked witch, and all that kind of stuff, right? Twister. Um, plus, there's that movie that uh, had a lot of special effects in it that was somewhat entertaining, even though it didn't really make sense. These guys just want to drive in the middle of a tornado. Anyway, a whole other conversation. So uh, people are politicizing their kids again. That's happening. That's the thing that's going on. Well, the left loves to do that. They have Greta Thunberg, when she's 16 years old, touring the world to lecture everybody on climate change as if she knows anything about any of this. And people feel so sad because that a child is waving a finger of indignation in their direction about how they're spewing too much CO2 or whatever. Um, but also, you know, blue check libs love to tell fake stories about how their kids disagree with the, you know, their eight-year-old disagrees with the judicial supremacy of overturning Roe v. Wade based on the constitutional conservative majority, thanks to Donald Trump. 
Eight-year-olds don't say stuff like that, but they like to tell us that they do because they think that there's some special authority that children have in political debates. This is a delusion of the left. It's widespread. Uh, and they'll even celebrate it publicly. I mean, here's a mom on CNN. I don't even know how this is a news story, but then again, it's CNN, which is a joke of a place, defending her daughter, um, well, or actually celebrating it, really, uh, extending the middle finger to anti-mask protesters at her school. You know, what else was she supposed to do in that moment? She was pretty fed up. She, you know, this was not a situation where she could engage in constructive dialogue. Um, you know, she's forced to ride the bus every day to school and see these people and she was done and she expressed herself. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my daughter and I'm fine with that. Proud of her, that's right. Stick your middle finger up at strangers because they don't want to have their kids masked in school. Yeah. It's amazing. So much bravery. CNN, how is this a news story exactly? Just, one, just wondering. Here's a real news story, though. The State Department, uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, really does seem like a, an ineffectual substitute teacher who's trying to get the class to calm down and everyone just thinks, why would we listen to you? You're a clown. That's Blinken on the world stage as Secretary of State. None of it really seems like it is going his way these days. Well, the U.S. State Department, as feckless as it is, has voiced concern over the Taliban being an all-male government. This is a quote. The State Department on Tuesday expressed concerns of the makeup of the new interim Afghan government announced by the Taliban, including the lack of female leaders and the past actions of some of those appointed at top posts. We have made clear our expectations that the Afghan people deserve an inclusive government, according to the State Department spokesperson. Yes, that's right. The, the Afghan Taliban is not, in fact, uh, into diversity and inclusion. And that is unlikely to change, despite whatever strongly worded memos may be sent their way by the State Department of the United States government. And that's something that we don't see, think is going to change anytime. By the way, there have been now... Uh, of the Taliban five, remember the Obama administration let four, uh, let five uh, Taliban senior leaders go in exchange for Bo Bergdahl. People were critical of this at the time. That was back in 2014. Four of the five are now basically the cabinet for the new Taliban government in Afghanistan. So we had a catch and release program out of Gitmo and the Obama administration made sure there are a lot of senior Taliban leaders ready to go so we could get back Bo Bergdahl. Um, and then there's Biden seeming a little confused. You may have seen the chance of, let's say, Fauci Joe Biden. They were saying a different F word all over college football games across the country. Biden, though, also thought that people were thanking him for visiting in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. But here's what was actually happening. None of them were shouting or complaining. Mm -hmm. Every one of them were thanking me as if it was something special. I mean it sincerely that I was here. They're all yelling at him about leaving Americans behind, but he thinks they're thanking him for visiting. In Biden's world, it's kind of all the same, I guess. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line, the No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Shields high.